If there's one hi-fi brand that is world famous, it would have to be Macintosh. And it's always a privilege to have a Macintosh in your hi-fi system to review. But just because it's a Macintosh doesn't mean that it automatically gets a thumbs up from me. It still has to earn it, especially when we're talking about an amplifier that costs this much, just shy of £15,000. So I'm always extra fussy and I always nitpick because I think it's right to do so. So has this formidable Macintosh MA9500 integrated amplifier with a built-in DAC and phono stage blow me away? <laughs> we have a lot to cover. If you're new to very high-end audio, you could easily feel that an amplifier like this, the Macintosh MA9500, is expensive just because it has that green illuminating logo on the front. But I'm sure there is some brand name tax being applied here, the same with most things. But actually, when you unbox the MA9500 and try and pick it up, it's nearly 46 kilogram weight. Straight away makes you realize there is a lot of something being used here. It must have some big transformers and autoformers. So pretty quickly, you realize why the Macintosh costs a lot more money than some other mainstream hi-fi integrated amplifiers. And even the mighty Griffin Diablo 300, which is another 300 watt you know, big integrated amplifier, it weighs about 35 kilograms. And even that really big integrated amplifier doesn't really even come close necessarily to this big, beast of a Macintosh integrated. Then 300 watts of power into eight, four and two ohms, thanks to the infamous Macintosh autoformers, means it's going to be suitable for driving most speakers most people will own, including some very large and demanding ones. And on the rear, the MA9500 is offering tons of connections for both balanced and unbalanced analog inputs, four more sources than any audio file could ever own. But if you wanted to compare, directly compare, maybe eight different CD players, well then this could well be the integrated amplifier for that. You have an analog input for home theater bypass and also a set of jumpers that you can remove if you want to just use the MA9500 as a preamplifier. And while I love that flexibility, it does really feel like a shame to waste all the amplification that's built in here, of course, but maybe if you upgrade to bigger and better ones, well then, why not? And that's before we think about the many digital inputs. That includes HDMI with ARC, USB, but I would have preferred to see at least one of the coaxial inputs have a BNC connection to save this audio file having to use an adapter. And coming back round to the front, the MA9500 looks like a Macintosh, but quite a busy one with all the knobs and screens that do fight for your eye's attention. And I have mixed feelings about the aesthetics, but I do love VU meters, who doesn't? And the motion of them here is fantastic, and it can be mesmerizing to sit and watch them. But sat back at about 12 feet away at my listening position, I couldn't really see the VU meters very clearly. Maybe I just need glasses. Now with an impress of the input selector, you have a few menu options. One of them is being able to disable the illumination of the VU meters, which I didn't do for obvious reasons. But more useful is being able to dim the brightness of the small bottom screen. And the small bottom screen is an interesting one because you need it on as it shows you important things like the volume as a percentage. Now I could just about see the volume from where I sit at my listening position, but if your eyes are not so hot, you maybe would struggle here because the volume never changes in size even when you change it. But it kind of doesn't matter when you have this much amplifier power because you're probably not going to be listening much above 50% or halfway. So you can just, I suppose, crank it until the neighbors complain.
Now a big part of the visual design with the Macintosh is all of the knobs that we have across the front, the famous design really of, of Macintosh. And these, you know what, they do feel a little bit plasticky. I don't know if they are plastic, but they just have a little bit of a, a, a kind of a plasticky type of feel to them. Maybe maybe I'm selling you know the Macintosh short there. And the knob, the knob feel, you know what, it's okay. I don't mind the feel and the and the resistance of everything, but it's definitely not my favorite of amplifiers that cost around this kind of money. But one feature I do really like about the Macintosh is the equalizer, the eight parametric equalization controls that we have access on the front because they're really, really easy to get to. You can see what you're doing and you can tune the sound. You can tune the sound of the amplifier with your speakers in your room. And I find that really, really useful. Now, this is not as specific or as comprehensive as using a full room correction system, something like Dirac Live, but I definitely prefer having it to not having it. But for those who don't like this type of thing, well, you can turn it off on and off easy enough from a button on the front. But one of the great things about this type of implementation is that it's active or can be active regardless of the source you're listening to, whether it be analog, whether it be digital. So once you've spent the time and dialed in the sound of the amplifier with your speakers in your room, well, then if you're listening to vinyl, listening to a CD or streaming music or whatever, that same equalization is being applied, so you're getting that same benefit. I do really like that. But there's one major downside to this system is that there is no real easy visual indication of what you're adjusting. Yes, you can see what frequency you're adjusting, but you can't see very easily by how much maybe you're boosting or how much you're taking away. So it's all a little bit of guesswork, which is absolutely fine. It's very possible to just listen and dial in the sound of the system to your liking. But where I think there could be an issue is that, yeah, you've got things really nice, but you want to maybe try and tweak some more. So yeah, you would tweak it, but then you're maybe guessing where it was before, so it's not easy to reset the settings. But that's a, a, a minor nitpick. Where there is more of an issue is when you're cleaning, when you clean the front of this and you accidentally knock the controls, which trust me, happened to me, it happens, it can happen really easily. It's very, very difficult to be able to put the controls back to exactly where they were before, where you was really happy. And it would be so much better if there was some numbered visual indication, either on the front or that showed up on the screen as you made an adjustment, or even if these worked on a click system, one click, two click, three clicks, like what you get with a real subwoofer, it'd be much easier to be precise and specific with the equalizer. And yes, this is maybe a nitpick, but you know, it would make, I think, a really nice tangible difference. But for me, the real beauty of the Macintosh is only really shown to you when you dim the lights, because that is when it looks its best, especially with a little bit of RGB ambient lighting. Now, before we talk about the all-important sound quality, I just want to confirm that I have tested the Macintosh with all manner of different things being plugged into it. And I have tested it with two completely different speakers, the Griffin EOS 2 and the Audio Physics Spark. Now, neither of these two speakers are hugely demanding for a big amplifier like this in terms of really, I suppose, power and current delivery, but they are both very transparent speakers, and they've shown me different things about the Macintosh. So it's been a great number of weeks trying and testing all different things out. Overall, I have found the Macintosh to sound clean, clear, crisp, fast, lively, and pretty neutral, which was a surprise to me because I was expecting a warmer, softer, squidgier type of sound, but not at all. But in saying that, I compared the Macintosh to the slightly more expensive Avid Hi-Fi Sigsum integrated amplifier, which is definitely the clearer, cleaner, more open sounding amplifier of the two. So that showed me that the Mac does have some character of its own. 
I think Macintosh have gone for a pleasing overall character with the MA9500. So it's strong in all areas, not necessarily stand out in one specific or particular area, but that means it doesn't have any weaknesses, no weak points. So I think that makes it very compatible with lots of different music genres, lots of different music sources, but also probably lots of different speakers. And the best bit for me has been the vocals. They're clear, they're large and expressive, but they have a little bit of sweetness to them that I really liked. And that is delivered without any negative traits or trade-offs. The Macintosh delivers vocals that have a nice rounded character to them that makes them very pleasing and enjoyable to listen to for hours. And the treble delivery, I think, is an interesting one because it will depend, I think, on what speakers you use, of course, but what speaker ohm taps that you connect the cables to. The eight, the four, I didn't try the two because I found the treble from the Macintosh to be ever so slightly too much of a good thing at times with the Griffin EOS 2 speakers, but I was probably using the wrong speaker taps. I used the eight ohm taps with the Griffins and they are six ohm speakers. So that was probably a rookie mistake from me. But with the Audio Physics Spark, that's our four ohm speakers, I realized this mistake and used the four ohm taps and I found the treble to be about spot on. Nicely balanced for enjoyment, clear and crisp, but maybe a touch play it safe for some for bite, but I really don't mind that and I definitely prefer it to the other way around. And the bass was also interesting because you would think 300 watts, a big amplifier, big transformers would mean this really big, authoritative, powerful bass. But it's not really what the Macintosh does. It's not really, I think, how it's been designed. And interestingly, doing a comparison with the much more affordable NAD M23, its sound is more kind of driving punchy for its bass. And I do really like that aspect about the NAD. It really is cracking, actually, for an amplifier for that reason for its price. But I think the 300 watts of power here is going into control, a tight, really tight and controlled bass. And the power is going into the smoothness of the transitions of the bass, which I found particularly impressive from the Macintosh. So yes, the bass isn't quite as driving punchy as the NAD, but it's very smooth and very articulate in its delivery. And of course, that's where the equalizer can really play dividends because we're able to really push the bass if we really want to. And because we've got so much amplifier headroom, we never have to worry about running out of puff if we want to try and push the bass more. So that's a really nice thing to be able to do. And it is possible to embolden and enrich the bass sound from the amplifier or from the amplifier speaker room combination. But even doing so, I wasn't able to achieve that same kind of driving punchiness of sound that I get from the NAD. Like I said, the Macintosh is always smoother, maybe a little bit more tube amplifier like in its bass delivery, not for being <laughs> soft and squishy. You know, the bass is tight and articulate, but just with a little bit more smoothness. In fact, this is a very graceful sounding amplifier for being such a big and powerful one. So I'm definitely not mentioning this as any level of criticism, just as a, a point of distinction difference. And that just leaves soundstage. With the Griffin EOS 2 driven from the Mac, they sounded big and bold in my room, but with a nice layered soundstage from left to right and front to back, even though they were placed up against my front wall because of the speaker's design. And that showed me that the Mac can do big and bold with great timing, soundstage layering and very good clarity. But it was powering the Audio Physics Spark that showed me just how clean and clear the Mac's delivery is. Because they give you a totally see-through soundstage with some amazing deep soundstaging at times. And they are also great speakers for small musical intricacies while staying smooth and musical, so long as you don't go mad with the volume. And the MA9500 was able to do all of these really impressive, important hi-fi things such as, you know, soundstage openness, clear, defined, you know, silence between elements so there is a nice space across the soundstage with really nice depth as well, with a nice musical character as well. So this is all very, very impressive stuff. But how good is the built-in DAC, the DAC 2? 
Well, actually, it's a very good built-in DAC, and I was enjoying and experiencing all of the sonic positive traits that I've just been speaking about. I would say it's a very clean sounding DAC, very clean and clear sounding, and it's a very good, very enjoyable DAC to listen to. But of course, I compared it to a very high quality external DAC, the Chord Electronics Hugo TT2. And the Chord did sound significantly better. The sound was more authoritative, just stronger and bolder in its overall delivery, which I preferred more planted, more secure sounding. There was better sound stage, more intricacies of music, and just a better overall sound. But that is a £5,000, you know, very high quality external DAC. So I think what that shows is, is that the built-in DAC 2 is very impressive, very good, very enjoyable, you know, and you could go that route if you like the all included type of solution. However, it shows that the internal DAC can be bettered. But what about the built-in phono stage? Well, for starters, I really like how easy it is to change the capacitance to suit your cartridge. It's an easy adjustment made in the menu and I much prefer this to dip switches. I also like that there is an MM and an MC phono stage for the long-term flexibility. But more important to me is that I just really enjoyed and really liked the sound. I really liked listening to the moving magnet phono stage that's built into the Macintosh because it has this really big and bold, really rich, quite an organic sounding phono stage that's just endlessly enjoyable. I could listen to records all day on that phono stage. And what I found interesting was, yeah, it's really easy going, very smooth listen to all day type of sound, but it was also higher quality enough to keep it interesting and clear enough for me to be able to hear things that I was changing with the turntable and some upgrades that I did at the same time as reviewing the Macintosh. And I could hear the differences and appreciate the benefits of the upgrade. So yeah, I really like the phono stage that's built into this Macintosh. Time to wrap things up. I am no stranger to big and powerful and expensive integrated amplifiers. I have reviewed loads of them. And sometimes these types of amplifiers impress you for their big bold character or maybe they're really warm, luscious or organic sound or maybe they just impress you for being really authoritative and powerful or maybe it's just because they almost have no sound of their own. And when you're talking about amplifiers at this kind of price point, of course they're all great, but they're just sometimes different greats for their own standout reasons. And that's what I think is interesting about the Macintosh MA9500 is that it kind of sits somewhere in the middle, trying to give you a healthy dose of all of these really nice and important hi-fi sonic characteristics. And I really don't mind that approach at all because I think it will make the Macintosh very universally compatible with different different speakers, different sources, and you know, different systems. And then I also like the added level of flexibility that's built in here with the equalizer and other bits, because I think it will extend that even further. But coming back to the question I asked at the beginning of the review, did the Macintosh MA9500 blow me away? Well, being honest, <laughs> that doesn't really happen for me anymore. I've listened to so much, you know, amazing hi-fi that it's very, very difficult to actually blow me away. But that, you know, over-eccentric question aside, I am in absolutely no rush to want to pack the Macintosh back up to send it back. <laughs> I'll end the review there. So I hope you've found this review interesting. I hope you found it useful and helpful. If you enjoyed it, please hit the thumbs up button. And if you enjoy my take on hi-fi and hi-fi reviewing, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.